And so I want you to get into groups of three to four. And you have a computer or a phone or a tablet. Um, and what's going to happen is we are going to describe four to six concepts that you feel like you have a good grasp on about PNF. So if you get into groups of three to four, talk about what it is that you already know, and then we can go ahead and post them. The website that you're going to use is up here. It's padlet.com backslash wall CFC PNF. And I'm going to go ahead and click on that so that we can see what everybody's saying. So when you get there, you can just double click and post your name and then write something. Wow, that, that's so cool. Uh, so you actually have to talk to each other. So turn around and make a friend or talk to an old friend. And what do you already know about this? And I work together to describe what, what's going on. What, what's your foundational knowledge of the Two more minutes. why we're getting this increase in range of motion. And it's all due to the Golgi tendon or organs and our stretch reflex to allow this to happen. But what we're really seeing bear out in the literature is that the theory might not really match up with what, we're, with what we see. We're definitely getting range of motion increases, but it might be more about that tolerance for stretch, okay? So it's very clear you guys have a good understanding on what's available. So now what I want you to do in your groups, I want, I'm gonna move a little bit ahead of these slides because you guys already know all this stuff. So you guys talked a little bit about, up on the board, the different types of PNF patterns. So we know PNF is identified for helping with increasing range of motion and stretching. We also know it's effective or it has some theoretical principles in increasing strength due to, in particular, the isotonic and isometric uh, contractions that are happening during the activity. So now what I want you to do is take your small group of three to four and combine with another group. So you should have a group of about eight. And what we're going to do is each group is going to be responsible for reading researching for a couple minutes about each different type, and then we're gonna do a little demonstration up here in the front of the class, okay? So get into your groups of eight, and I'll get you your assignment. Slow reversal, hold, relax for stretching. Rhythmic initiation. Repeated contraction, slow reversal, 
So how is that different than the one we just watched? Okay, so can we show that one more time, showing the contraction of the quads? So are the quads contracting to increase the range of motion of the hamstring? Or is it a passive stretch? The first time it'd be passive, the second time it'd be with the quads. Okay, so passive through the full range of motion, isometric, Contraction of the hamstrings, <coughs> followed by concentric contraction of the quads. Mm -hmm. So as we're increasing, instead of that relaxed portion, with the last group, right, they moved into the increased range of motion without the contraction of the quads. Now we're using the quads to help relax the hamstrings and move into more range of motion. Are you is, that, <laughs> is that making sense? Yeah. So they look the same, right? We just 
no, need to know that quad has to work to contract. All right? Next, slow reversal, hold, relax, stretching. Yeah. Yeah. I'll post that after class. She said she wanted you guys to have it, not have the answers beforehand. for 10 seconds and then the clinician's going to push forward into that motion to sort of extend the hamstrings. Um, but yeah, that's it so far. It's kind of similar to the other one before, but it, I guess it's done a little bit slowly with the relaxation period. Okay, so the, the big thing is about the you're kind of going through the movements and you're progressing um, the contraction or the movement that she does. So if you're working with the rotator cuff, you're going to have her um, go into flexion and then extension. We're also working with internal rotation, just totally passive range of motion. I'm moving her. She's not um, moving her arm at all. And then we're going to go active assistive. So then she's going to kind of move with me, moving both. And then you can have her either go on her own, just totally active, or you can add, with the strengthening point, you can add resistance. So she'll push against my arm there, all the way back. And then she comes down, she'll be pushing forward against my arm. So you're, you're basically doing the exact same rhythm, moving it in the same, just kind of progressing from a passive to an active slash resistive contraction. Okay, so here we're using, have you guys talked about D1 and D2 patterns before? Yeah. Okay, so let's go back a little bit. So here they're utilizing a D1 pattern moving from across the body. D2 pattern, my bad. Um, where we're going, we like to say this, check out my sword. So I'm gonna take my sword out of my pocket and show it to everybody. Look at the sword, it's awesome. Okay. okay, so I gotta take the sword out of my pocket. Okay, so we're utilizing movement patterns to help improve neuromuscular control. Okay. So part of rehab is understanding that strength is a component and range of motion is a component, but coordinated movement is what gives us functional movement and the ability to participate in sport. So early in the rehab, this kind of activity can be really great, particularly in the passive component. But as we progress, we can add that active assisted and we can add the uh, resisted range of motion. And here in this picture, you can essentially see against resistance, a cable, a uh, tube, um, or you can get that kinesthetic feedback from the practitioner or the coach or whoever's providing resistance. Okay? And so for upper extremity, we have two patterns. We've got the, let me show you my sword, which is the D2 pattern. And then there's a pick an apple out of the tree and put it in a, put it in a basket. And that's going to get us the opposite kind of component at the shoulder. Okay? All right. Repeated contraction. So 
was kind of the same as Aaron. Um, the only difference is I said rhythmic. They're going to push against it. I'm going to kind of apply force in the opposite direction. It's just, you know, one movement across the shoulder for an internal rotation. Okay, so we're doing isotonic contraction, which means we're moving through the whole range of motion, right? We want to apply resistance through that entire range of motion, but we're only working in that one direction. So if I'm working into flexion, I'm only applying resistance into flexion until I get fatigue. If I'm working against extension, I'm only providing resistance against extension until fatigue. Okay? <coughs> Slow reversal. So we're getting isotonic contraction. Again, contraction through the entire range of motion, but now I'm providing resistance on both patterns, in flexion and in extension. Okay? And it's important to understand, and, and you're going to get these slides, but it's important to understand it's not just motion at the shoulder. We're also getting muscle activation at the elbow, wrist, and hand. So regardless of the, the pathology that we're working on, we need all those muscles firing to get that functional mo motion that we talked about, right? That neuromuscular control. So we need to provide resistance against all those motions. So it's not just resistance at the, at the shoulder, but we can add that resistance at the elbow, wrist, and hand as well. Okay? Slow reversal hold. <clears throat> Followed by a relaxation phase. So what Courtney's gonna do, she's gonna push down to stretch his glutes and he's gonna exert a little bit of force. She's gonna hold that for about 10 seconds and then relax for about 10 seconds. And then just repeat that. Okay, and the key here is repeating it at different points in the range of motion. So not only are we getting that end range function, but we're actively stretching and contracting at different points in the range of motion. Because when we think about muscle physiology, we have to get uh, all those cross bridge formations to happen, right? And at various degrees of a range of motion, if I'm in a fully stretched position, I can't create those cross bridge formations as well as I can if I'm in the mid range of motion, okay? So we wanna do it through, the, through various points in the range of motion. Rhythmic stabilization group. Really matter, and I think you guys really got 
to the point of this in some of the research that you've already done, the, the review article that you read, we know that uh, changes in range of motion occur in <coughs> PNF. And in theory, we think that's due to autogenic and reciprocal inhibition, but this is not necessarily supported in the literature. And some of this is about some of the fancy words they talked about at the onset of that article, Hoffman reflex and those kinds of things. Um, when we really get down to it, the outcome measure is that we have improved patient outcomes. Okay? So we know patients get increased range of motion. We also know that they're not long term if this kind of stretching activity doesn't continue. So if I don't keep doing this, I will lose those range of motion gains. Okay? We think that the increases in range of motion are attributed to increased stretch tolerance, but again, the theoretical foundation, the reason why we you know, conceptualize this activity, makes sense from a physiology standpoint, but it's not really bearing out in the literature. And we're, at this point, we're simply hypothesizing why this is working. And acute PNF stretching produces joint range of motion greater than some of the static stretching. So how many of you have experienced either working with teams or uh, in, the, in the rec center or in the gym where you see people doing partner stretching, static stretching, how many of you actively do static stretching? I'm pretty sure I statically stretch every day. So disappointed in myself. Um, so how many of you guys experience that where you see static stretching being the most common thing that we do? Sometimes the idea of that is to simply um, actively engage the muscles and warm up for activity. But when we're talking about looking for significant increases in range of motion to help with return to activity or to improve performance, we need to think about other ways to actively engage the muscles. And we know that PNF definitely works for increasing range of motion. Okay? I want to check time. What's that? Perfect timing. Um, so I guess it's open to questions from you guys about either this lecture or <coughs> me or. <coughs>